In this reading, Adam is on a run, a lengthy run through the countryside. And he's thinking about his parents. They hadn't always been this angry slash wary slash scared of him. His childhood had been all right, even filled with talk of blessings after four years of effort to have a second child had been so literally fruitless they had just given up. As was often the way with these things, Adam was born eight months later. My baby, she'd called him, for too long, for too many years, until it stopped being a phrase of love and started to contain within it an iron weight of instruction. You will never be our equal, they seemed to be telling him, no matter how old you get. Especially when all his little friends growing up were girls. Especially when he never watched the Super Bowl but never missed the Oscars. Especially when he started to seem a bit gay. She had actually said that in front of him at a Wendy's one Sunday night after church. Do you think he might be a bit gay? She'd asked across the table to his father, as 15-year-old Marty looked furiously into his chocolate frosty, and 11-year-old Adam's face stung as keenly as a slapped sunburn. All he had done was mention how fun the dance classes sounded that the son of his sixth grade teacher was taking. No, his father said to his mother, too quickly, too firmly. And don't talk like that, of course he isn't. With his eye on Adam making clear that this was only partly belief and mostly command and 100% denial of any dance classes. The subject hadn't come up again, not once, in the intervening six years. Nobody here was a fool. Not Adam, who had mastered clever internet searching before his parents knew what a Wi-Fi child lock even was. And his mom and dad were both educated people, not even a little bit blind to what the world was like, how it had changed even in Adam's lifetime. But sometimes it felt like change only happened in far-off cities and was having too much fun there to make it out to the suburbs, where the benefit of his parents' education was merely that they smiled and kept mostly quiet about their certainties rather than discarding them. His father was an evangelical minister, after all, with Adam as a son. Particular denials of reality were going to be necessary for anyone in that house. So no one talked about it. But there had been curfew and sleepover restrictions that Marty hadn't suffered. First in Adam's friendship with Enzo, and only less in his friendship with Linus, because they barely knew Linus existed, Angela covering for him to an extent he'd never be able to repay. Church, twice on Sunday, once on Wednesday, was mandatory, of course, and his regular trips to Christian summer camp were more strictly enforced than Marty's, too, though Marty had only been too happy to go. Even Adam's joining of the drama club at school was not so subtly resisted until he told them he was also joining the cross-country team. He crossed mile four at the end of the old railroad path, having to turn sideways to get past five moms pushing five strollers side by side. It was usually at this point in the run that he was no longer arguing with anyone in his head. Oh well. Angela, his best friend, loved her parents. They were the kind of family that laughed together over dinner. She hadn't had a curfew since 14 because they trusted her not to get in any trouble. When she'd lost her full virginity, as she called it, the experience hadn't been what Angela was expecting, and she and her mom had actually talked it over afterwards, though not before Adam and Angela had thoroughly debriefed first. Adam imagined the look on his dad's face if he'd gone to him the first time after full penetration with Enzo. An elderly man on what appeared to be a homemade bicycle looked up and grinned at Adam's passing laugh. Adam turned down the path that ran along a stretch of lake front, across a side bay from where Enzo's party would be tonight. He had only been planning to run six miles, especially with the chrysanthemum delay, but felt like he needed to make it eight, needed to push that little bit further. He had reached the point, that rare point that sometimes happened in a run, where he felt aware of his youth, aware of his strength, aware of the temporary immortality granted in those moments of fullest physical exertion. He could run these last four miles forever. He would run them forever.